Let's talk about you being CEO of Zappos. What does that mean now? Are you, are you actually running the company? And then you're going to explain Teal to us in a non-complicated way, which would be great. Teal is the way they're running the company now, correct? Uh, Teal is more, uh, I guess, the philosophy or, or the uh, intention behind it. But specifically, the system we're using today is a system called Holacracy. Holacracy, right. right. And it'll take a long time to get into all the specifics, but I think the simplest way to describe it is we're moving from a system, which is how most corporations are designed, which is about command and control. So and fascist. Try to, try to plan and, <laughs> and try to predict and plan to a system that's more uh, self-organized, self-managed, and it's more about sensing and responding on an ongoing basis. And so uh, I think the clearest example is if you look at all the different organizations that have happened, or whether it's in nature or in uh, amongst humans, cities are actually the best example where not only have they stood the test of time, but they actually scale. So every time the size of a city doubles, innovation or productivity per resident actually increases by 15%. But the opposite generally happens with companies. As they get big, bigger, they get more bureaucratic. Innovation per employee generally goes down. And so part of it is how do you scale innovation in an organization? And then the other part of it is really about resilience and longevity. So if you look at, uh, I think the Fortune 500 list came out first in 1955 or something. Mm -hmm. And 88% of the companies that were there in 1955 on that list are no longer on that list. So the default future for companies as currently organized is death, and that's something right. that- 1955, although right. I, was, I was not around then either. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it, was a very, it was 70, whatever. I don't do math. Um, but, but you're talking about, you had a very successful company. You, were, uh, you had a company that had, and I had been on your tour, you had, had a very friendly company. You had one that did a lot of various things that were quirky, but not a wholesale change of the system. Um, it was a basic company, and you were enormously successful doing this, and so successful you sold your company to Amazon. What, why did you want to change it, and then what changed for you as a, as a CEO? Because if you, it, as I understand in reading Holacracy and Teal, there are no managers, there are no leaders, they're sort of, they're semi-leaders, um, but it's a very different system. So you had enormous success using this other system, and then At you, a certain scale. At a certain, okay. And so, I think one of the things that I felt in probably every uh, employee, not just at Zappos, but in general, as companies get bigger, they get more bureaucratic and there's more people to try to convince of something. And so stuff just generally moves slower and it's not really any one individual's fault. It's just a function of the way it's structured hierarchically and, and, and how the typical structure works. And so uh, where you don't get that is Again, in cities, and not only that, but so one, one of my favorite examples, if you think of Manhattan, there's something like three days of food supply for all of Manhattan, but there's no central food planner, and people and businesses just selfishly consume foods, food, and then that creates opportunities for food suppliers, and the whole system just works. And Manhattan never runs out of food, and a bridge could go out, there could be a natural disaster, it's resilient, it responds and adapts very quickly, and that's really what we're trying to move towards for Zappos. And so my motivation is I want something that outlasts me and a company that is still there 500 years from now, and that's something that you don't get under the current structure. So that begs the question, why sell your company at all? What was the impetus to doing this? And what does Amazon think of, of this? Because Amazon is not run as a holacracy, I think even if you took the best case scenario of the New York Times article, you wrote a, you, you wrote a book called um, um, Happiness. Wait, wait, no, I know what it is. Anyway, you were, what I'm sorry? Happiness? What? Delivering happiness. Delivering happiness. That, that story sort of was delivering misery, it seemed like. Um, how, do you, how do they think of what you're doing? Are they, you allowed to do what you want or do you have to perform? And if you're not performing, they're gonna come in and, uh, Invade or what? Yeah, so so Amazon actually tried acquiring us several years before right. the Many actual acquisition. Did, not just Amazon. And uh, and at the time they wanted to acquire us and integrate us and 
and so on. And so we actually said no right away. And, and then they came back a few years later and said, okay, we, and we told them that the only way we would even consider the scenario is if we could operate independently, if we can have our own separate culture. And uh, basically, we think of them as our equivalent of a board of directors. Mm -hmm. And from our point of view, back in 2009, which is when the acquisition happened, it was as if we swapped out our previous board of directors with a new one that happened to be composed of Amazon folks. And mm -hmm. so, have to report what is this, six, seven years later, uh, they've remained true to their word. And I don't know if this is true for all their subsidiaries, but mm -hmm. this was actually, we have a written uh, document that basically outlines exactly what I, what, I, what I just said. And surprisingly, but we've actually gotten more freedom from them because with our previous board of directors, which consists of, consists of VCs and so on, uh, it was much more uh, financially driven in terms of the short term, whereas Amazon understands the value of customers in the long term and really their long term thinkers. And they're, I totally agree, their culture is very different from ours. And if I had to guess, probably most Zappos employees wouldn't do well in an Amazon environment and vice versa. Uh, but they've basically left us alone. And is left. there any way, any circumstance where they would come in if you're, for example, your growth hasn't been the same as it was in the beginning as small companies do tend to be fast growth companies. Is there any, any impetus for them coming in to change that? I, think I mean, it's, it's happened at other I, companies. I think it's no different from, forget Amazon, if using our previous board of directors, if we weren't performing to the financial metrics that we committed to, then there would be a conversation. So why do this? Do you feel like your company was going sideways? Do you, because you, again, you had enormous success what you were doing in the first place, which was sort of a, uh, you know, you had a much, it was a much more benign way of doing it. This has a lot of rules and strictures. It was more, um, again, I would say quirky and sort of typical of many, many internet companies, but not gone this far. And many people have, like wonder about it. They, You're talking about Amazon? No, specific? about you, about you, not just Amazon, but others. Why change, do this change in your You're talking about holography yes. and yes. the self. It's, I think it's really just about trying to get ahead of it. And even myself, I feel like as we've gotten bigger and in Vegas, we have about 1,600 employees right now. We were just getting more bureaucratic. And if you look at the innovation per employee uh, metric, then that slowed down. And so it was really, I, I think it wasn't really so much a focus on Holoxy, which just happens to be the platform that we're using now, but really just doing research and looking at what results in longevity, uh, what results in resilience. And with the previous speakers, like the first speaker talked about how do we continue to have the innovation, and it's basically by having this other group of people that he doesn't mess with. And so how do we actually, you know, for in his example, it's about him being the benevolent CEO that allows that to happen. Whereas I don't want it to be dependent on my benevolence or the next CEO's benevolence. It needs to be built into the structure. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at a city, uh, yes, different mayors can do good and or, or possible harm to a city but it's not gonna cause the city to collapse. And cities have stood the test of time. They stand the test of innovation and scaling and, and, and so on. And so, so that's how really should you, so, so what is your role? What do you do if there's no, are you the CEO? You have your, your title still, but in your system, they are not necessarily called, there's not, that there are groups and circles and various things. What do you, what do, you do all day? Are yeah, you completely so, useless now? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the only way I get interviewed at conferences like this. <laughs> and so um, it's, uh, it's interesting because it, it is useful externally, but internally there's a very specific constitution, just like the US has a constitution that spells out the specific authority that I do have and don't have. And so mm -hmm. in the old world, I could have technically just then walked it. up to any employee and said, you're fired because I don't like you. And, mm -hmm. uh, and whether I did it or not is, it doesn't mean I couldn't have. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, like, I 
definitely cannot, even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so there's, in terms of my specific, what you're referring to as the CEO role, uh, my authority is actually very limited. And that being said, I actually fill a number of roles. It's probably 10 different roles within the entire organization. So what do you do all day? I'm still, I mean, what do you do? Not, you don't get to fire people. You don't get to tell people what to do. Um, what do you do? What, is your, so, what do you see as your role in this new system? And, and then I want to, you know, a lot, a lot of employees it didn't work for. This hasn't worked and you, a number left um, because they couldn't deal with the system. So what two very different okay. questions. I'll, yeah. I'll answer the first one. And, uh, and so it changes, and, but not just for me, but for uh, all employees. And I would say probably every employee fills a number of different roles within the organization. And, they can resign from roles and take on other roles and, and so on. And so these are moving from circle to circle. Yes, and that's I'm trying to stay away from the holacracy speak, okay. but um, but I think the media has kind of portrayed it as there's just total chaos. There actually is still a hierarchy. But no, I think they, they portray it as a crazy cult. But go ahead. A, a crazy cult in total chaos is well. That's so sort of the definition right. of a yes. crazy cult. But go so, ahead. Um, and so it's actually, in, instead of a hierarchy of people, it's a hierarchy of purpose statements and, and then employees can, and there's different roles, and then employees can actually fill multiple roles. So it's kind of one layer of abstraction removed. And so in the old world, if someone is higher up in this hierarchy. Like the director of HR. Then that automatically implies they have more power than everyone under them. Whereas in the new world, you might fill one role up here and one role up here and one role up here. And there's even multiple cases where in one circle you may actually have more authority over someone else here filling a role, but your roles may be completely flipped in a completely different equivalent of a department over here. And so for me, it's really just about filling whatever need the company has. And it's not just me though, but every employee can constantly move around to really continually fill whatever the company needs. Um, and then the second question was, the was about, Some employees don't like it. Right, and so the difference is this whole move to, and the big, bigger picture thing is it's about self-management and self-organization, which essentially means we're trying to turn every, call, it's called a circle or a team, whatever you want to call it, and into its own startup and every employee into almost like a mini entrepreneur, which mm -hmm. is not for everyone. And I would say on average, it's in the world, forget our specific implementation, my guess is it's probably 50-50. Some people just wanna know and be told what steps one through 10 are and if, if they execute on those steps one through 10, then they know they've done, done a good job and that works really well in an old world environment where the manager is the one telling them Here's exactly what you need to do and how to, how to do it. And so what we found, and there was actually a research study that was done, I think a year or two ago, where they looked at what separated the great entrepreneurs from just uh, typical managers or uh, people that were just reporting to managers. And they found that great entrepreneurs actually over-indexed for three characteristics. One was being comfortable with ambiguity. Second was having a strong sense of curiosity. And then a distant third, but still uh, over-indexing, was emotional intelligence. And so those are characteristics that were now. Emotional we, intelligence. Right. Which yeah. isn't, you don't see a lot among tech CEOs. Uh, oh, come it on. Depends. Well, it's a distant third. So the first two are distant. most important. Yeah. But it's still over-indexed compared right. to the general population in terms of what makes for right. okay. uh, for a great entrepreneur. And so those are characteristics that are kind of baked into our core values already if you combine them in different ways, but now that we're specifically looking for. Because if people really need to know what steps one through 10 are, they're not gonna thrive in this uh, environment. And so there was another study where they looked at, uh, I think they compared entrepreneurs with uh, MBA students mm -hmm. and, or graduates, and they asked them to go make a dish. And what MBA students would tend to do is they'd go decide what they wanted, go Google it, uh, look up the ingredients, go buy those ingredients, and then make that, and then deliver exactly what they were looking for. Whereas what entrepreneurs would do was they'd look around the, open the fridge, look in the cupboard, and then look at what ingredients there are, 
and then cobbled together something that had never been made before, and that's what they made. And so that's the type of employee we're looking for. So do you, so you, you do get a lot of attention in the media for this. Do you, do you mind it? Because it, it, it does come, it, it can come, it's disturbing to a lot of people, I think, what you're doing. And especially when you were so successful doing it the other way. Do you think this is the only way to success for Zappos going forward? So the media tends to focus on the Holacracy aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, whereas I'm really focused on the self-organization, self-management mm -hmm. part of it. And so I absolutely believe self-organization, self-management is the future. It's the only thing that has stood the test of time, uh, not just in humans, but in nature as well. And if you look at a, use a rainforest as an example, there's no CEO of the rainforest. Mm -hmm. and. Well, uh, God, and, but go ahead. Well, so I think of it as like, let's use a greenhouse analogy. All right. All right. So Sorry. maybe a typical, uh, okay, complete aside. God is totally top down, by the way. I'm going to, since you threw in God, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite jokes, which is, All right. did you hear about the uh, dyslexic agnostic insomniac? He stayed up all night wondering if there really was a dog. So, <laughs> anyways. Um, that was a good joke. I have a dirty iPhone joke, but I'll tell it to you later. Um, OK, so, so if, if I will you, later. If you uh, think of a greenhouse, and maybe a typical CEO is, say, the strongest, tallest plant that all the mm -hmm. employee plants one day strive to be, uh, that might be a typical uh, CEO or, or corporate environment, whereas what I'm passionate about is really, and how I think of my role is, how do I work on, how do I architect the greenhouse so that it creates the right conditions for all the plants to thrive and you know, all the potential that's already within them can, uh, it's not really So you think this is the only that. way to stay innovative at Zappos and make it a better business than it's ever been? Not just innovative, but long-lasting, resilient, mm -hmm. um, but yes, innovative. It's well. interesting because right now the political climate is very tough. The people that are being, you know, uh, I mean, Donald Trump is not that kind. Of, I can't imagine him doing holacracy or being on the bottom of anything. <laughs> At the same time, I don't know how much whoever was president 20 years ago mm -hmm. actually, uh, I don't know if any president, because of the way our Constitution and system mm -hmm. is designed uh, will actually cause permanent harm, say, a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. right? And so that's what I'm trying to focus on at Zappos right. is how do you make it so that it doesn't matter who the CEO or president or mm -hmm. whatever it is, that a hundred years from now it'll still be resilient, it'll still stand the test time, it'll still be innovative. Well, they do have the nuclear bomb at their disposal, so there is a problem there, but, um, but no, let's, let's hope not. Um, let's talk about the business itself then. So you're, you're trying hard to keep innovation going, keeping the company for the long term. It's been selling all kinds of products, which is, which, is, which is more mundane than what you're talking about in a lot of ways. Like you're selling shoes, you're selling other objects. How, how is that business now online and how has that changed? Because you all sort of pioneered something that got a lot of attention, it did really well. Um, how it, where is it going now? Where is the actual commerce business ha having created yeah. a success? So one? internally, we use we actually use the word "wow" a lot. It's actually one of our which uh, one? Wow. Wow. Okay. W O W. So yeah. one of our core values is to deliver wow through service. And uh, what I like about that being one of our core values is that it just it's environmental uh, and competition uh, dependent. And so. When Zappos first started, this idea of free returns was a big wow. But right. Now Everybody else is copying. But them. now we're not the only ones that do mm -hmm. it. And, and then uh, when we encourage customers to call our 1 800 number, uh, that was a big wow. And then when customers actually call us, then that becomes a big, big wow. And uh, what's interesting as this is a tech ish conference is. As everyone's moving more and more towards how do we become more high tech, we're actually moving more and more towards how do we become more, more human, more humanizing. And so when customers call us, it, we have their uninvited, undivided attention for five to 10 minutes. And what we found is if we get that interaction right, we actually 
have that customer for life, and their lifetime value goes up by four, between four and six times, and it doesn't, they don't even actually have to place an order, and it doesn't even have to be their first order. And so we're actually trying to figure out how do we get our customers to contact us in a more low-tech way, and we view our call center not as an expense to minimize, but really as a branding investment that we're trying so to what, get more So what would of. be that next wow? What, they have borrowed a lot of your things and used them, and they, they're sort of table stakes now. What In, in, in com, online commerce right now, what has to happen? Well, I guess me, so there's people that are focused on how do you increase conversion and do all that standard e-commerce stuff, whereas what I'm personally thinking about is how do we expand beyond just e-commerce? And probably the clearest example is Virgin, where they started out with music and now they're in hundreds of businesses and it's all built on their brand. And for us, it's kind of the analogous thing. How do we build off of the Zappos brand, off the Zappos culture, and off of uh, just our customers' emotional feelings towards us? And, and then how do we actually build off of stuff that we're already building for ourselves internally, and I think, the, I don't know all the details, but the story of Slack is a great example yeah. where I think they were into trying to do games or something. No, he was making a game, it was right. a huge failure, he ran out of money, and he had, a, he had nothing but the system that they used internally to talk to each other. And, right, and then and now so that's Hor its own yes. great business, and yes. so we've, historically, we've kind of dabbled in that, we've had other companies come and uh, we have this, uh, actually we have a bunch of people right now that are from all over the world where they come to for a three-day equivalent of a boot camp to learn about core values, culture, customer service, and talk to the different right. heads of departments. So that's its own little s side business for now. But we always get requests for what are the internal tools that you use for uh, helping build culture. So anything from... So that's from, not selling things. So you imagine your business, your biggest business, not to be selling things at some point? Well, selling software as a service, potentially. And so it could be anything from how we ha have complete uh, transparency and clear accountabilities in org chart software to how we get employees to get to know each other when they log in, pop up a random uh, face and uh, quiz employees on who that is and then have them learn each other to how do we do peer-to-peer -peer cultural reviews that are based on core values. It's all values. about your management. It's, it's, it's about how you manage the company. You're selling how you manage the company. It's, uh, I guess it depends on what the companies are individually mm -hmm. interested in. So we happen to care about culture and core values, but they care about some other uh, thing or a KPI, then they could just My point being it's not, sell, let's sell more shoes or let's sell more, sell more shoes in Sri Lanka or something like that. We want to do both. And so, so in, well, in that in that zone, Amazon just announced it's selling a lot of its own apparel and and other things. Do you feel that's competitive? Uh, no, we actually think that it's going to be uh, I don't know what the word is additive, multiplicative, mm -hmm. and uh, there's actually because we obviously use their warehouses now that we're part of Amazon, and and uh, and so we can help each other out. So where do you imagine your role in five, what, do you, what is Zappos in five years or 10 years or I 500 think, apparently? So for me, what's really exciting is really this whole, use the metaphor of the greenhouse or the city and, and so on. So if you ask, if, if I asked you what your vision was for what was gonna be three blocks away from you five years from now where you live, like that's kind of a hard question to answer or, if uh, there was a newborn and you said, what is your vision for this child uh, 20 years from now, then th I think there's certain uh, values and uh, maybe learning abilities and so on that you want to infuse into that. But at the same time, it's the, the, the shift that, it's interesting, the prior two speakers were talking about is you have to let go a little bit of control and let whatever evolves uh, evolve with the right under the right conditions and under mm -hmm. the right environment. And what I'm interested in is how do you do that from a systematic process and culture and values perspective versus me saying, I happen to be CEO today, so this is what I'm gonna uh, benevolently let evolve. So, so we, uh, one, one more question. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask what happened in Vegas here. And you moved your company into the middle of 
old Las Vegas, really. Um, you tried the holacracy experiment in to try to create innovation in, a, in a, an area that needed development, that was downtrodden and had some issues. It hasn't worked as well as you had felt. What, what happened there, and where do you see it going? So holacracy, so part of it is that we actually are still using holacracy in, uh, for example, the real estate side of, of downtown project, which is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. But I would, specifically holacracy, it's a platform. So the analogy I use is, imagine if someone handed you the latest iPhone and the latest iOS, but no apps on it. And you got it, you would just think, okay, this is not really a great, phone when really all it's missing is the apps. And so you have to figure out, not only do you have to use this iPhone, but you have to build the apps itself, yourself. And so that's basically what we're doing at Zappos. Luckily, we're big enough with 1,600 employees where we can actually carve out the equivalent of an app developer for this platform. And so I think for companies that are starting right now, they're in the position where they still have to build the apps, and so what I'm excited about is once we, and we've iterated and figured out a lot of stuff over the, I think, roughly three years that we've been been doing this, then we can share what works and right, doesn't work what didn't work in downtown Vegas? You were trying to create an innovative city with all kinds of startups, many of which failed. What happened there from your perspective? I think it's just uh, the natural like that's what it is to be an entrepreneur. Like some of the things, not every first venture is going to work, whether it's a small business or a tech startup, startup, and some are going to work. So we literally, I think, have invested in over 150 different companies, some mm -hmm. of which are small businesses and some are uh, tech companies. And what uh, I think the media misses out on is what's actually happening on the ground. And so uh, one of our first small businesses that we invested in is, I, I met her at a coffee shop, her name's Natalie, and she was literally, she had worked for 10 years at a um, one of the restaurants on the Strip and had literally packed up her bags and was leaving town because she was sick of the casino lifestyle. And, and this was like, I don't know, three years ago. and. We decided to invest in her when I learned that her dream was to open up her own breakfast place. And so she opened that up. We invest, we put all the capital in, and within one year and three months, not only did she pay back her original capital, but she started mentoring other first-time restaurant entrepreneurs. And now she's already opened up a second restaurant. Her first restaurant was a breakfast and, uh, and lunch place that has been written up by all the food magazines and so on. And then her next one, her current one, is this Chinese food and Southern concept that's dinner and, and lunch. And So that's a success. But a lot of hope was dashed by a lot of people. Again, I'm not trying to hone in on it. So you're, tr you're talking about creating your company like your city, but then you were trying to create a city, and it's not quite as easy to just create Well, I think that's what's, that's what's I think we're basically trying to provide an extra level of safety. So let's go with the city environment. Uh, if you start a small business and it fails, as many small businesses will, then you it's pretty hard to start another small business. And so there's no one that's going to provide you an ongoing salary. So at Zappos, we're actually trying to find that combination between how do you have the safety and comfort of having a salary and at the same time get the benefits of being like an entrepreneur within an organization? So we're trying to and in Vegas? find that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, in downtown in Vegas. Vegas. So where is that going next? Do, where do you, are you investing more money in it? What are you, you're just going to wait yeah, and see Yeah, we actually happens. just had a, it's been a sequence. So we started out, because originally the area that we were focused on uh, was not, safe where Container mm -hmm. Park is now. Yeah. I would have felt unsafe myself three years <laughs> ago, and now we've had three, mi no, it's a lovely uh, three million visitors, uh, kids and family all the time. And literally just yesterday or the day before, we had a groundbreaking ceremony for uh, an apartment complex. So it, so you consider it a success? What's happened there? We've, it's a work in progress. It's a work so. in progress. 
like any startup, probably. All right, last question. What's the thing that most people misconstrue about you? Um, I would say because I'm generally introverted and shy that most people, and this is feedback I hear from other people, that because I don't say a lot when, if they're around and, and I, I don't know them, that they think I don't like them when mm -hmm. I'm just shy. But sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes you don't like them, right? No, I'm kidding. No, you like everybody. That's me. I'm sorry. I'm projecting. Uh, anyway, Tony, thank you for coming. Let me get some questions from the audience, please. Questions right here. This is mystery guy, right? Yeah, we'll do this one. I want to know who you are. I'm not like Jason. Who are you? You can't talk. I, Where are you I'm from? Mark. Mark from? Howe. I'm a co-founder of a company called Shopswell. Um, okay. And I'm going to mention it this time because we strive to be helpful. We're building a community for consumers in commerce, which is nuts. There's a billion dollars in bodies on the beach. But we're going to try anyway because we want to be helpful. And a lot of what I hear about what you're saying is oriented around being helpful. And I just want to give you a shout out for staying true to your convictions, like staying convicted around the things you believe in. As an entrepreneur and as a philosopher, I love that. And I know that you don't have to be at all, you just have to be part of the story. And thank you for doing that. So stay real. Thank you. Next question, right here. Hi, my name is Todd Wade, I'm with Visa. I'm curious which of your ideas you think will sort of get adopted independently of kind of the whole system. Like which ideas might just spring free uh, and be adopted by large companies or schools or other groups? And even that, what's worked best? Well, one of the things that we're, I think this whole idea of employees being able to have multiple roles within the organization has, would, has, would be interesting whether it was holoxy related or typical organization related. And so we've been internally developing this tool ref that we call people points, where 100 people points refers to 100% of someone's time. And then, so we had an example where someone was doing IT tech support for 50% of her time, and then was focused on uh, diversity and, and uh, women equality and so on, the other 50% of her time. And that would be hard to be able to do under the typical organizational structure. Uh, whereas with people points, we can just tell, uh, whether it's under Hiloxia or in the old world, we can tell a manager, OK, your budget, rather than saying your budget is you get five heads, it's your budget is 500 people points. So we don't care whether you hire five full-time people or 10 half-time people. And then there's certain accountabilities that everyone signs up for based on however they allocate that budget. So that's something that I personally think would work in any world and would allow employees to both be more innovative and happier, more productive, because if they're passionate about things that might be as disparate as IT and uh, gender equality, for example, then there's a mechanism for them to do it. What if people don't self-organize in a way that's helpful for the actual business? Which wins, the company structure or the actual business? So there still is budgeting, both from a people perspective and a dollar perspective, and it's still hierarchical. It's just that in the example I just gave, uh, it's budgeting by roles. And so that, same, that manager that has five full-time equivalents or 500 people points can they, they have the budget for that, but, uh, and so I'll use an internal example where we have someone who's focused on charity full time, so that would be 100 people points, but that doesn't mean every employee, uh, or 1,000 employees can go suddenly decide they all want to do charity right. because I mean. that would go over budget. I see, okay, so the person picks that, the person in that area can pick that number of points they Right, and they could decide whether it's one full-time person or two half-time people or so on. I can see why people, I mean, it, it could really be disturbing to people who are used to not that. Like in salaries, I can't figure out how you do salaries in that. So that's, uh, that, that's actually an area that is probably the hardest thing for, uh, I'd say both for us to figure out and for employees to uh, wrap their minds around. But basically, the, I'm trying to think of the close, the close analogy might be, uh, were you ever in the Girl Scouts? Or? No. 
But you know who they are, or yeah. you earn badges. I'm aware of the cookies, but okay. go ahead. Or Boy Scouts, so, so you earn different badges yeah. and, and so on. And, and, uh, and so I, w I was in Boy Scouts, although I never made it to Eagle Scout, but you earn different badges. Yeah. But just imagine that uh, the analogy would be, if you get an Eagle Scout badge or whatever it's called, then you get this salary. Correct. And if you get whatever level is below that, then you get that salary. You gotta get badges. And, but there's multiple ways to it's not like you have to get exactly these 20 badges. It's but they're badges. You have badges then. Yes, that's actually what we're referring to them internally. But there's multiple ways to get to that same uh, salary. And who determines who gets the badges? Uh, the same people as in the Boy Scouts. I, I, like there's different people that, mm -hmm. like if you want to get in the Boy Scouts, the camping badge, oh, that's going to be a different things. person okay. than okay. if you're going to get the woodworking badge. Lots of questions. Let's have them answered because they're interesting. Hi, I'm Shri, and I'm co-founder of Chargeback Gurus. And you talked about being shy and introverted, and you know you're still, you know, very uh, quoted in the media. And do you have any tips for entrepreneurs who are also probably shy and introverted? Because right now, being extroverted seems to be more celebrated than you know leadership and all of those cir circles. Um. Drink lots of alcohol? I don't, I don't, um, I don't, so, I, I, I don't know. I think it's different being, at least for me, my, like, talking, like, if there's a, if I go to a party and I don't know anyone, then I will probably leave the party very quickly. Um, it's much easier one on one, or, but even that's, I mean, the first three times we met were pretty awkward. And yeah, they now, still are. Now it's just awkward. It's awkward. <laughs> so, um, what I've found is uh, the strategy that works for me is for so, for example, we had a uh, shop talk event last night at a uh, downtown where I, I live in an airstream park. It's like an urban version of Burning Man. There's campfires. There's Couple of alpacas. There's chickens. You have there's two, right? Two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And he so he lives in an airstream. Just so, you know. so, and we do this pretty regularly. Where whether it's there or in at a conference or whatever, I generally will invite people to come over. And then I think last night we had a hundred people or so. Uh, or at the TED conference, we'll rent out a suite and. Uh, invite people over for drinks or food, but it, but then when they come, I'll say hi to them, and then I'll like either let them figure it out for themselves or ho hopefully uh, introduce people to each other, and so then I don't have to talk to them for uh, <laughs> like kind of in an awkward way for for a while, and then but I can still be present. And then, uh, but I guess it's kind of similar to the greenhouse, like that would be my greenhouse. And, and then just kind of step back and let that happen. And then if you do that with the same people for, I don't know, five times, then I think b both people feel more comfortable and then it's not this weird pressure. And, and then you'll also just throughout the night randomly have conversations, but they're not like these forced equivalent of blind dates where you have like have to talk to each other for half an hour and then figure out how to awkwardly end the conversation. And so, um, so that's my strategy is uh, generally if someone comes to me, then I'll try to figure out who else in the room they would get along with and then introduce them to each other and then extract myself from that <laughs> scenario. So drinking and partying. Um, let me just go ahead right here. And I was wondering um, how the SuperCloud IT project was oh, yeah. going with the Amazon that. and um, how that integration has maybe impacted your business. Yeah, so the way... This uh, is, explain what it is. For right, so, so SuperCloud, the way I think about it internally is uh, it's almost the equivalent of AWS, which I assume you guys are all familiar with, but with a lot more functionality that uh, probably Amazon only exposes most of uh, internally to other 
uh, departments or subsidiaries. And so from our, from our perspective, there was a lot of, st we went right around the same time that Amazon acquired us. There was a lot of stuff that our tech folks were working on that really didn't add value to the customer. And so things like there were just necessary things you had to do with security, for example, uh, where it needed to be done, but it didn't really add value, additional value to the, to the customer in terms of innovation and so on. So we made the choice to basically leverage Amazon's uh, existing systems, and they have, I don't know how many thousands of engineers that are doing all sorts of stuff. And so the idea was migrate our underlying platform of stuff that Amazon already had, and, and that, so that we could free up our engineering resources to focus on the more customer-facing, innovative stuff that was unique to Zappos. And so the thing that sucked about it was that it was a multi-year long project that I would, I used to be an engineer that at least I wouldn't have been excited about before doing that migration. Uh, but the good news is we're, a lot of that work is already done and then there's still some uh, minor things that we'll, we're working on over the next few months. But it's now freed up our engineering resources to really focus on the stuff that can differentiate uh, Zappos and, and the also, stuff that we care about. You're also making the management changes at the same time. Yes, so we, we did. We did, you're just and fucking we moved, with your employees. All and over we the moved place. downtown at the same time. Yeah, and you the moved former downtown. city hall. So what are you going to do next? Was, um, I don't know. Re invite reporters over? No, you do that a lot. You do that a lot. Um, last question here, I think. Uh, I'm Fabio Zizini, uh, Chief Product Officer at Shopkick. Um, my question is, uh, in a normal company structure, employees expect you know, personal growth, development, and career uh, promotion. How do you deal with that in the holacracy system? Um, well, if you go use that badge analogy that I was about, that's how in the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, it's, it's uh, the difference, I guess, is maybe under the typical corporate structure is here's exactly steps one through 10 to climb the corporate ladder. Whereas now it's, here's all these badges you can earn and these different experiences you can, you can have and you kind of choose your own adventure. And um, it might have been, did you read, is it Sheryl Sandberg's book talk? I can't remember Lean if it was in. her book that talked about, Lean In, that talked about instead of a corporate ladder, it's a jungle gym jungle or, gym, or right. something. So right. that's more what uh, we're trying to move towards. Yeah, so you would, so you would, they would get promotions out because there is no such thing as a promotion, correct? Or did you just get, be, you just get merits? It would be like when you get Eagle Scout, then you're promoted to this. And, and so the, I guess the nuance difference is in the old world, I, at least under more, most corporations, it's if you f get this uh, role or this title, then you automatically get a promotion for it. Whereas for us, it's more if you earn these badges, which is more about past experience and, and knowledge and so on, then you get, uh, uh, potentially get compensation uh, adjustments associated with that. And so, um, and so it's a little bit of a nuanced difference. And, and, and the difference is that it's, when you fill a role in a typical organization, it's what is the specific value you're adding right now? Whereas this philosophy is more, what's the uh, potential value to the organization. And so easy example is that uh, you would be willing, rightly so, to pay more for a fax copier combination than just a fax or just a copier, even if you're copying 99% of the time, but you're paying for that potential of a fax copier. And that's kind of the philosophy we have towards uh, employees in the and new context. You, can you ever fire anyone then in this system? So. The man, so in the old world, the manager would be the one that fires someone if they're not a good fit. In the new world, the, it's called a lead link, uh, but they can remove someone from their role, but that's a completely separate process from if someone is fired from the organization. And we have 500 circles or teams. Uh, each, of, what, each of those circles has something called a lead link, and lead link can, fire, can re, sorry, remove anyone from any role at any time. And also on the flip side, any employee can resign from any role at any time. But 
that doesn't mean they exit the organization and they basically find another circle. Right. So just like in a city, like if you uh, leave a small business, they're not kicking you out of the city. But if none of the other small businesses want to hire you or none of these 500 circles want to hire, have you fill a role, then there's policies in place where uh, if that happens for two weeks, then the system basically exits you. Exits you? What is that? From, because we're still paying your, your paycheck. Right. But it's not, it's different from, there's actually not a person that specifically fires you. You just get exited. From, <laughs> well, I think at some point we believe that if you're not actually doing any work, then we should stop paying you. Yeah, you should use, yeah. <laughs> you should move, use drones for that. All right, I'm gonna ask the very last question. If you weren't doing this, what would you do now in tech or digital or anything else? Um, and then we'll have drinks, everybody. I don't know, I think my passion has always been around something, uh, I guess a combination of something that's consumer uh, related somehow and, and something that allows the, uh, the creativity of other people to, to thrive. And, and, uh, and, and so I think that's part of what I love about Zappos is every single phone call, because we don't have scripts and they're not limited on call times and so on, that's an opportunity for each call center rep to really just do what it takes to be themselves. What would you themselves. want to do? What would you want to, if you weren't doing this? Like, I, I guess you what I'm saying be is. cannot be at Zappos. What would you do? Right, so it doesn't matter what environment. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, maybe poorly, is that I want to help create, uh, maybe Burning Man's another great example, if, if that had existed already. It's just how do you kind of create the blank canvas and the right infrastructure of processes so that all these amazing things can happen, whether it's at Burning Man or over the phone or at a party or event. Okay. Well, everybody get some drinks and ask Tony any question you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.